Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Twit Live special number 340, recorded Monday, May 6th, 2019. The Build Vision Keynote. Hello, everybody. Leo Laporte here, Megan Maroney there. And in a few minutes, we're going to go to Seattle, where Satya Danella, the CEO of Microsoft, is about to give the kickoff keynote for the 2019 Build Developers Conference. The Vision Keynote. It's going to be a Vision Keynote, which honestly is probably the least interesting. There won't be product announcements. Uh, there won't be any technical details for developers. It'll really be, though, for somebody who wants to kind of understand what Microsoft's future is it'll be the the architect the chief architect of microsoft's pivot of microsoft's remodel uh, explaining uh, what he sees as the future so i think with some help we're going to be able to explain uh, what this all means yeah i think i mean even though it's a developers conference the keynotes are usually like their corporate statement right They're like here's what we have to say to you all it's not aimed at developers usually it's not necessarily aimed at real consumers. I think it's aimed people, at the press. It's aimed yeah, at, yeah. at us. Yeah. They, there are several other keynotes which will be more developer focused, uh, but this is the one with the CEO. So this is the one we're, we're going to cover. And in order for everybody to understand it, after our commentary, Paul Thorat and Mary Jo Foley, actually working for Microsoft, are going to do their commentary. And I think this is an interesting thing. Remember last year uh, at Microsoft's keynote, they put everything all together. It was a three and a half hour talk. So long they had to have a stretch break in the middle. Uh, so I think they were smart to break it up a little bit. This was the first part of last year's keynote, and that's what we're going to see today. So we're waiting for the uh, keynote to begin. Right now they're giving prizes out to winners of what they call the World Championship of Imagine Cup. These are uh, college students who've got startups. This is uh, the winner of the Challenge Cup, which actually was quite an interesting uh, product, a uh, glucose meter that uses a smartphone and a special lens and is non-invasive. It actually uh, measures your blood sugar uh, using the smartphone. I thought that was pretty cool. He's going to get, what did they say, $50,000 in a Surface Go. And so, he gets to get a mentoring session, right? With, with Satya, Satya Nadella. Nadella. Yeah. So Priceless. As soon as, <laughs> as, soon as uh, they wrap that up, we will uh, go to the stage. At Microsoft Build, 6,000 developers, uh, Windows developers from all over the world in Seattle for this event. Kicks off today, goes through the 8th, and as they did last year, and I thought maybe they'd fix this problem, it overlaps with another big developer conference. Google I.O. starts tomorrow. We'll be covering the keynote of that tomorrow as well. Um, so I guess if you're a developer, you have to choose Google or Microsoft. And pick one. Or maybe you could go today and then go tomorrow. Fly, to fly down a mountain view and go, yeah. to the, go to the other one. Same coast. Yeah. That's true. So uh, as soon as they're through with the uh, Imagine Cup, we're going to get to Satya Nadella and our coverage of Microsoft's keynote. And again, what we'll do is uh, we'll keep going after uh, Satya's keynote. You and I will wrap up and then uh, we'll continue with their stream because I want to see what Paul and Mary Jo have to say. And then after they wrap that up, uh, we will reconvene about 1 o'clock this afternoon, Pacific time, 4 p.m. Eastern about uh, four hours from right now and do Windows Weekly. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit of a different schedule. Normally, Megan and I would be here tomorrow doing iOS Today. That's going to be taken up 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern time by the Google I.O. keynote. And then you and I will take the Windows Weekly slot Wednesday at 11 a.m. Pacific. I know, confusing, but just as a little uh, background about what's going on. So uh, Google's going to be giving away a lot of stuff at Google I.O. It looks like uh, they're going to be at least giving away the new Pixel 3a phone. Also, rumors there'll be a new Google smart screen. And, uh, and uh, there'll be a uh, perhaps an a Android Wear watch. Doesn't look like Satya's going to be saying there's something under your chair today. No. Um, no Windows phone under your chair. <laughs> Maybe leftover Windows phone. For sure, no Windows phone <laughs> under your under your chair. But perhaps they'll uh, they'll have something later in the uh, conference. And, Not today, though. I mean, even the, the other developers conference. I mean, they you know Google I/O is a developers conference, but they're going to talk about hardware there. I doubt they're going to really talk about hardware during this conference. Maybe like I mean, they did announce the Hololens two developer edition, um, which is available later I, this year. Yeah, that's true. But yeah. that's really it, and that's. Um, so they're not really, 
I think they're going to talk more about the cloud stuff. This Azure's is a, their big this thing. This is a little unusual for a big company. I mean, you go to a Google event or an Apple event, and the CEO will start the event usually and talk a little bit about their vision for the future, maybe five or ten minutes. Microsoft has for several years now given Satya Nadella an hour or two to kind of explain what he's doing. And I think you kind of have to say that that's because Microsoft has changed so much over the last few years. Mm -hmm. And Nadella's uh, five-year tenure, there was a great picture uh, of Satya Nadella on the cover of Bloomberg Business Week uh, this week, um, hovering in the clouds. He really has gotten a lot of credit for uh, remaking, they call it the, Bloomberg calls it the nadella -sance. I don't know if that's exactly the word you want, but for remaking Microsoft, here's the image of Satya Nadella as a, uh, the greatest tech company of the 1990s is back. The headline reads, The Miracle of Microsoft. Uh, and he kind of looks like, I don't know, looks like maybe an angel from the good place. I'm not sure exactly. I think it looks like, it looks like soap, like a, like yeah, a, a Tide box. Yeah, 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 exactly. But I, I am Snow. impressed. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that last year he talked a lot about privacy, so I imagine that he'll talk about that a little bit. Um, I wonder if he's going to talk about the news that's come out like about a month ago. I think you were on vacation and I was uh, co-hosting Windows Weekly about the complaints of the boys club culture at Microsoft. It was the, you know, that they were sort of, uh, there were a lot of employee complaints so I wonder if he'll bring that up. Both Microsoft and Google have faced employee revolts over the last few months, uh, chiefly over their desire to do projects for the Defense Department, for mm -hmm. the U.S. government. Uh, Microsoft, uh, I don't think, had quite the revolt that Google did. No, they didn't have the walkout, and they didn't, they weren't accused later of, um, of you know, retaliating yeah. against, the, yeah. as Google yeah. was. I think, by and large, uh, Microsoft, of the big five tech companies, I would say Microsoft probably has the best culture, which isn't saying very much, uh, the best of the, the five, maybe, I mean, probably Apple and Microsoft both have the best company culture right now. So it was, it was rare that Microsoft did get called out for that. It, chiefly, it was about the uh, contract to do HoloLens for the military. Uh, and I'm not sure where that stands now. I don't, unlike uh, Google, where Google backed down and said, all right, we're not going to bid for the Jedi contract. Amazon immediately said, we will. We'll do it. Um, Microsoft uh, employees under the collective banner of Microsoft Workers for Good um, took issue with a half-billion-dollar contract Microsoft signed with the military last year um, to use the HoloLens. Um, Microsoft said, no, no, it's going to be for defensive use. <clears throat> but uh, according to reports, the HoloLens would, inc quote, increase lethality of U.S. troops by enhancing the ability to detect, decide, and engage before the enemy. And this is a big problem when you have engineers who are very important to a company, both at Google and Microsoft, and they say, well, we don't want our work to be used uh, for defense purposes or military purposes. On the one hand, every company in America, that's a big part of, of the business for many companies, not every company, but many companies in America, certainly has been for years for Microsoft. But on the other hand, you can't lose, you can't afford to offend these employees. You, these engineers are, are hard to come by. The group, I don't think, I don't know what the upshot, upshot of this was, but the group wanted them to cancel a contract, cease development of all weapons technology, and create an independent uh, ethics board to uh, ensure that, quote, such morally ambiguous deals aren't signed again. Uh, only 100 staff members signed that letter, though, so it wasn't the magnitude of the revolt that uh, Google faced. I don't expect Satya Nadella to talk about that today. No. What he will talk about is the great success that Microsoft's had. Of course, their quarterly results last week uh, showed a very good profit. Uh, their, top, their stock has completely uh, reversed itself. They were briefly a trillion-dollar company uh, this month. And I expect he'll talk a little bit about uh, Microsoft's vision for clou a cloud-forward uh, um, world. Waiting for Satya Nadella to take the stage. She's a little late. We uh, expected the uh, keynote to begin at 8.30 Pacific time. It's now 8.38 and uh, as you can see, there's a pretty big crowd somewhere. Is that the, uh, I guess that's the stage. They've turned off the lights, so. Mm. Um, as of last month, The Verge says that uh, that the army is still using a yeah. version of the HoloLens. Yeah, I think I think Nadella's uh, response was, well, we, we take your concern seriously, but uh, we feel that this is an important 
contract force. Right. It increases the lethality, but might also save the lives of soldiers. It has some too. defensive uses as well, yeah. Mm -hmm. And and after all, I mean, uh, as as Jeff Bezos said, uh, doing work for the U.S. military is patriotic. We're an American company. Uh, who who do you want to do this work? Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's a good point. But I think it's also important to realize that companies like Microsoft, Google, uh, even Amazon, are really dependent on engineers who have a lot of clout, as you can see in a, mm -hmm. in a country company like this. Uh, looks like. Um, they're just panning over the floor of the build conference. These conferences, uh, typically, just like WWDC and Google I.O., you'll have some speeches, some keynotes. You'll have uh, seminar tracks that developers can go to. And you'll have booths like this where developers can go from booth to booth, see what other people are doing, see what Microsoft's up to. These are really fun, these developer conferences, if you're a developer. Uh, and... Of course, Microsoft's developer conference is interesting uh, because they create uh, the tools as well as uh, the technologies that people are developing for. And they have one of the biggest platforms in the world. Certainly Windows is the biggest operating system platform uh, with uh, more than a billion and a half users. But there's also Azure. And that's one thing I think uh, Satya Nadella is going to talk about is uh, how Windows and Office, which for years were the moneymaker for Microsoft, are being replaced by the cloud, which is essentially operating system agnostic. And I think he's done that pivot very well. Yeah, and of course, I mean, it doesn't compare to what Amazon, AWS, their market share is much bigger. No, but Azure. number two, they're yeah. number two, about half the size, I think, of uh, Amazon uh, Azure services. And number three is Google Cloud services. So Microsoft's made a lot of money there. And, and one p important point to make about these cloud services is the profit margins are very high. Um, and that's why, really, that's the profit that powers Amazon. They make more money in Amazon Web Services than they do selling products or advertising or anything else that they do. Uh, Microsoft uh, is, you know, in the, biz in the busy, difficult job of turning this giant battleship um, from desktop software to cloud services. But they seem to be doing a very good job of it. Mary Jo says that uh, she thinks Such is going to talk about how they're the best for certain things. They're the best cloud for AI, the best cloud yeah. for blockchain, mixed reality, edge computing. That's uh, that they're not maybe the biggest, but they're the best for these specific things. In the past, you know, when this pivot began, he said, we want to be wherever our customers are. It was kind of an admission that, well, it may not always be Windows. That's why, in fact, Microsoft developed the first touch first versions of Microsoft Office, not for Windows. But for the iPad, he said, we want to be where our customers are. But he added a clause, and I don't know if this still is part of Microsoft's vision, but he said, but we always want the best experience to be on Microsoft products. Um, I have a feeling that that was an important part of the pivot to reassure uh, the Windows division and the Office division. But I don't know if that's still part of the vision. We'll, we'll listen carefully for language along those lines. Do the, does Microsoft still think the best experience is on Windows, uh, on uh, PCs. There's a guy in a giraffe onesie. I like the giraffe onesie. <laughs> I do. Uh, we're still waiting uh, a little bit late to begin the keynote for Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella. I don't expect we'll see uh, other Microsoft employees, nor will we see new products at this keynote. I think it's going to be entirely uh, Nadella talking about his plans, his vision. That's why they call it the vision keynote. I think there's a funny thing because all these developers conferences are now there's IO and then next month, WWDC, the Apple um, developers conference. There's this idea in the press where people sort of complain, like I was saying before, like, oh, it's for developers and they're just talking to consumers and press. And, you know, this is a developers conference. But then also the press, um, especially on Twitter, uh, complains about how boring <laughs> they are. So it's sort of like we went both ways. It's important for companies, uh, you know, you only get a few moments in the sun. And so when companies have events like this that are widely covered, people are paying attention to, even if it's a developer conference, they're going to take advantage of those keynotes to position themselves for the public and the press. But don't forget at WWDC, at Build, at Google I.O., from the developer's point of view, the most important part are the seminars, the mm -hmm. things the behind sessions, the stage. Yeah. And, and frankly, the lobby con, the getting together with birds of a feather, other developers to talk about problems, issues, and just to socialize. That's always a big part mm -hmm. of this. I was talking um, to Rich Siegel, who was, of course, the uh, creator of uh, BB Edit, Barebones Software. 
who said, alas, he wasn't able to go to WWDC this year. It's coming up uh, June 3rd. And he said, that's the thing he missed the most. I said, is it what you learned there? He said, no, no, it's, it's seeing my old friends. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think for a long time, those kinds of tech conferences, I certainly my you know, memories of Comdex and CES were always about uh, the, that yearly get together to see those people mm -hmm. you don't see every year. And I think with WDC, they uh, a lot. Of, I mean, the tickets are so expensive yeah. now. A lot of people just go without a ticket, so they can have that, you know, hanging out right. part. That's right. <laughs> just meet in the lobby. Yeah. Not only are tickets expensive, they're hard to get. All three of these developer conferences, Build, Google I/O, and WWDC, have lotteries now because it's so hard to get a ticket. There's six thousand places to. Uh, for developers at uh, Build, but I'm sure there are many, many more Microsoft developers. The good news is in almost every case now, these companies will not only stream the keynotes, but after the fact, all of the seminars, all of the workshops will be, or most of them will be put up online. So uh, developers who can't go for a variety of reasons often have that uh, opportunity online. And I think that's a good thing. That's something that's happened fairly recent. Microsoft quarterly report uh, results came out uh, for uh, Q3. Uh, last week, they said revenue $30.6 billion had increased 14%. Remember, Google got dinged for its revenues only increasing 17%. So, uh, but it really has more to do with expectation than actual numbers. Uh, income $10.3 billion for the quarter for three months, and that was a 24% increase year over year. Uh, net income, uh, $8.8 .8 billion, a 20% increase so Microsoft had a very, very good quarter, and it was a lot of it due to cloud services. Uh, commercial products and cloud service revenue was up 12%, driven by Office, Office 365 commercial revenue growth of 30%. Uh, LinkedIn, also a big success, 27% growth for LinkedIn. That was, of course, this, the business social network Microsoft acquired a few years ago. Microsoft's... Uh, Consumer cloud products are branded the Dynamics products, and uh, Dynamics products and cloud services revenue was up 13%. So 43% growth in Dynamics 365. So Microsoft's looking pretty good. Satya Nadella is going to come out, you know, in a good mood and, uh, and perhaps ready to take a victory lap. His plan for Microsoft has actually come to, absolutely come to fruition. And this is his fifth build, his fifth year? Uh, it is his fifth year. It's either his fifth or his sixth build. He celebrated his fifth anniversary a few months ago, so I'm, I'm, I think it might be his sixth build. I'm not sure. Here we go. Let's go to the stage now. Good morning. Welcome to Microsoft Build. They're wearing uh, the new... My name is John Knoll, and I'm Chief of Creative Officer at Industrial Light and Magic. John Knoll, uh, of course, Apollo 11 moon legendary was cutting edge technology creator of, of the 1960s. Photoshop. And today, with the help of my friend, fellow Apollo aficionado and author of A Man on the Moon, Andy Chaikin. Hi, everybody. We're going to recreate the mission using some 21st century technology, using the power of Unreal Engine and HoloLens 2. Andrew? Thank you, John. Well, the Apollo 11 moon landing happened 50 years ago on July 20th, 1969. And like you, I've been waiting for that for a long time. And what made it possible was this. <laughs> Microsoft. So we're <laughs> seeing, for those of you listening, we're seeing a picture of the Milky well, Way. But apparently it's, not. Uh, it seems that doing a live demo is actually we supposed to than, see. Uh, I love the live demo Indeed. fails. Yeah, but boy, that's a terrible Thank way to start the very. <laughs> They're leaving. They're gone. Oh. Wow. Um. Holy cow! I'm, Talk about a colossal cringy. fail. Oh, poor guy. That's as bad as Michael Bay's uh, Samsung keynote. That that's uh, holy moly. <laughs> Now, oh. <laughs> tail between the legs, John Knoll, the creator of Photoshop and currently a visual effects supervisor, chief creative officer at ILM, embarrassed off the stage to oh. begin Microsoft Build. Get the glucose guy out there. Wow. <laughs> Team glucose. Holy cow. Uh, let's go back to whatever the hell's going on now. <laughs> it's Is there audio? Video. Oh, it's well. back to the Imagine Cup. 
<laughs> oh, Imagine, no. create, code. Oh, that was so awkward. I feel so bad for them. Oh, man. Big technical issues going on. I don't... I don't know what's going on. Here comes... Uh, I think here comes Sachin. <laughs> Oh. Very sportive. Polo shirt. Build Great chinos, sneakers. To see you all in Seattle. Pretend like you know, nothing build happened. Build has always um, had a very special meaning for me. Um, I remember very distinctly being in the audience in 1991 uh, at our very first developer conference. And um, that's when I decided to join Microsoft. And ever since, I've marked the passage of time and life and tech paradigms. And so it's great. Uh, to be back here at Build and talking about technology. Uh, I wanted to first start by welcoming all the young developers in attendance. In fact, for the first time, we have children of Build attendees. Uh, here we have our student ambassadors, of course, the Imagine Cup uh, participants, as well as students from local schools in Seattle. Was so special Sun welcome Microsystems. to all of you. As a technologist uh, until 1992 when he meant, moved to Microsoft. You know, Build is all about imagining what's possible, uh, but more importantly, making it possible. And over the next couple of days, you're going to be looking and seeing a lot of technology. But the real thing is, how do we galvanize and come together as engineers, as developers, to make that world possible? And when I think about the world today, as computing is getting embedded in the world, where every place, whether it's our homes, our offices, factories, stadiums, every industry from oil and gas to retail to agriculture to financial services, everything from connected cars to connected refrigerators to smart surgical tools to smart coffee machines, are all being driven by software. I remember this from previous That's Nadella keynotes. He loves lists. In front of us, the opportunity for developers and our colleagues from all other disciplines to come together to build this new world. And that's the sense of purpose mission that grounds us at Microsoft to empower every person and every organization on the planet to achieve more. It starts by empowering all of you as developers to go after that moonshot in any industry, in any sphere of life or society. Now, we'll talk a lot about this opportunity throughout this keynote and throughout this conference. But we also share a deep responsibility together. It starts with us as platform providers, but we have a collective responsibility. A few years ago when we started talking about it, it felt a bit prosaic to talk about responsibility in tech conferences where it's all about the glitz of technology. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's no longer the case. You're seeing this more and more uh, from all tech us, companies talking about really ethics, responsibility. About the trust. And I think it was, Nadella was the first to use the word ethics. In the technology years ago. we build is so core. And as engineers, we need to At the time, truly it was incorporate this in the core design tech CEO process, who used the word ethics. in the tooling around how we build things. So when we think about privacy the and the fact sector that than anything else. privacy is a human right, is as much of an engineering design principle as an engineering I've been waiting for Microsoft issue. to double down on privacy. They haven't Same had the best record up to now. Same thing with AI ethics. But compared How to Facebook and Google, mm -hmm. without bias. they do have an opportunity. And they've seen Apple succeed with that. Have to push the state of the art around but the they, he did say that last year, the same thing, the privacy yeah. is a human right. Yeah. We take to what we build. In fact, talking about cybersecurity, one of the most important things we have to ensure is our critical infrastructure remains secure. Uh, I'm really thrilled to announce an open source project, which we have collaborated with a, a partner called Fair uh, and uh, Free and Fair. Uh, and this is Election Guard. Uh, one of the things that we want to ensure is real transparency and verifiability in election systems. And so this is an open source project that will be live on GitHub by end of this month. 
which will even bring some new technology from Microsoft Research around homomorphic encryption so that you can have the software stack that can modernize all of the election infrastructure everywhere in the world. And it's fantastic to see this type of innovation really across all of the core areas of trust. Now, I want to talk about four distinct platform opportunities. Throughout this conference, we no will victory really laps for Nadella, even though he's currently CEO of the most valuable uh, the company in the world. The is the intelligent cloud and the intelligent he's edge getting right to the platform meat of the that matter. Azure enables. Uh, that's the thing that we'll spend a lot of time on uh, today, as well as the rest of the Remember conference. Remember, former head of Azure it before he ascended the to the CEO job in 2014. So it also provides the data and he AI has a real love and understanding of uh, We'll cloud. talk about business process automation as a first-class platform uh, for the first time at our developer conference. So important. Uh, so we'll talk about Dynamics 365 and Power Platform. We'll talk about Microsoft 365 and how this is the productivity and communications fabric that creates the scaffolding for all developers. We'll talk about gaming. So these are the four <laughs> platforms that <laughs> I want just to gonna, really get I'm into gaming. in some detail. So let's start with Azure. We're building out Azure as the world's computer. We have 54 data center regions around the world. In fact, we are so thrilled this to have the This is his son heritage uh, coming back. Public, Remember, son for a long time said the network the is the computer. The and I, I don't think anybody really understood uh, what son meant when they were saying it. But now Nadella is referring really, to Azure as the, com the, the world's computer. Uh, that happens around that uh, data center cap capability. Uh, we also have more certifications than any other public cloud out there. Uh, we have over 90 compliance certifications. And why is that important? It's because it, we have to meet the real world needs, regulated industries, data sovereignty needs, operational sovereignty needs. You need to be able to meet the world's complexity with what you build so that it really enables all of you as developers to be able to build with less friction. We're also building out Azure as an open platform. Windows and Linux is first class. .NET and Java are first class. SQL and Postgres are first class. We have Kubernetes workloads. We have Red Hat, OpenShift workloads. We have uh, workloads from VMware. We really want to make sure that every layer of the stack, again, meets the needs of developers. So this is the flip side of what he said, stopping. your experience will be best yeah. with Microsoft products. Remember I was saying he We're said that in the past. Now the he's saying everything is first yeah. class. Microsoft no longer is first among equals. And I think that's a big shift. Computing, which is there's a cloud and an edge and distributed computing will remain distributed. So Azure to Azure Stack, to Azure Databox Edge, to Azure Connect, HoloLens 2, Azure IoT, Azure Sphere. In fact, in this conference, I'm really thrilled about the Azure Database Edge. Uh, it brings the database engine to ARM processors in the edge. So has everything time is first class, support, but Azure support. is Azure's the is first among As long as first. it's on Azure. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think what he's saying, and this is really what's happened with Microsoft. It was the big surprise was putting Linux on Azure. He's really saying that we're not going to be biased against non-Microsoft products on the cloud. And I think that's important. Developers want to hear that. It's certainly... You know, when they acquired GitHub, that was a big concern people had, and uh, I think he's he's re-emphasizing that. That is the this is a different, very different security. Microsoft. The development environment. How does the DevOps pipeline work across the two? And as importantly, the technology stacks. And this is where you can make simplistic assumptions of having some homogeneous infrastructure on the two sides. You have to meet the real world needs. So that's what we've been hard at work in, Microsoft. When we talk about hybrid, it's doing the hard work to bring this level of consistency between the cloud and the edge so that developers can move the code that they have today and build a new code on top of this platform. Now, in fact, this right after my keynote, you're going to hear from Scott, uh, where he's going to talk in much more detail about all of the features, functionality coming 
uh, to Azure. In fact, there are 25 major updates and new features right at this conference. So oh really boy. thrilling to see the progress <laughs> Scott Guthrie, made. Of course, goo, they call and him. all this is He's leading to amazing Azure. momentum in Azure. The world's brands <laughs> are building on Azure. 95. This is not a vision keynote. This is really uh, Nadella's pitch uh, and it's great to see for the, the new Microsoft. And actually, I like this. Uh, I think developers, this is very much aimed at developers. One of the things that really excites me is right now, as we speak, Not there the are more software foot. developers Maybe 15. being hired outside of what is considered the tech industry, and it's only going to grow. That's the proliferation of what is the power of software going forward, and you see that ambition. So I want to talk, tell you a little bit about these stories. First is Walgreens Boots Alliance. Now, Walgreens is one of the largest pharmacies out there, and they're doing many things with us, but one of the things that I'm really excited to see is so they're also working with This is the slide that Nadella was referring to with Scott Guthrie's keynote. Uh, I don't think anybody in the uh, audience, if you show my screen, uh, John, I don't think anybody in the audience was able to read that slide <laughs> before it was taken down. That is a lot of new products. Largest beer manufacturer, they have this very nice phrase, which is from barley to bars, where they're completely revolutionizing how they think about the supply chain and the yield uh, for barley or, uh, to tracking everything using IoT to also then using cognitive services to track social media. So it's end-to-end -end digital transformation. From barley to bars. Now, St. Jude's and DNA Nexus. DNA Nexus is the ISV working with St. Jude's Hospital to you know, really go after this fight against childhood cancer, which is an underserved research area to be able to then use Azure Genomics to get the genomic data, but most importantly, how do you create a research cloud so that scientists from multiple organizations can all collaborate to go after this disease? JP Morgan Chase has chosen to use the Azure blockchain service to bring the, the Quorum, so which is, is a what variant of Ethereum, like Azure for uh, blockchain, to market, Azure uh, for yeah. edge computing. Yep. It's fantastic to see the innovation of new software products and projects coming uh, from the financial services incumbents uh, as well. AT&T is just rolling out 5G, and they chose Azure Stack for their compute on the, at the edge, and they're working with ISVs uh, such as Warpole, which is a drone safety tracker. So the idea that you need low latency edge compute in order to be able to really make sure that the airspace with drones is safe is such a critical need. So therefore, that's kind of a sample application uh, of what is possible as 5G rolls out, and then you have this ubiquitous cloud and edge. Now, I want to bring us home to another iconic brand that's right out of Seattle. In fact, it got started a few uh, miles from here at Pike Place, Starbucks. Uh, Starbucks is, of course, defined what our morning coffee experience is. Um, and, and, and at this point, one of the things that's so exciting to see is the software engineers at Starbucks, their ambition, their collaboration with their colleagues in the business side and product managers and marketing, they're coming together to completely take what is that iconic experience of Starbucks and incorporate digital throughout. Everything from what they're doing with blockchain and sustainability, IoT and the coffee machines, this, uh, well this speaks AI. to Satya Nadella's kind really of core belief that uh, keynotes from companies shouldn't be about uh, new products, which is, of course, what Apple always real. does, but about uh, the company's uh, customers and what they're doing. Microsoft really likes to talk about partners. This is a very classic uh, enterprise technology companies. They talk about partners, the Today partners. Today we're going to show you three things Starbucks are doing. So now apparently we're in a Starbucks. And enable their personnel. <laughs> Firstly, create more intelligent Rao, customer experiences with an internal uh, AI platform called Deep Brew. Secondly, <laughs> securely connecting their coffee equipment to Azure with Azure Sphere. And finally, providing transparency into how the cup of coffee you You're drank this morning is made its way from the farm to your local Starbucks.
Starbucks have created a sophisticated intelligent recommendation system based on reinforcement learning models that they call Deep Brew. Starbucks can use Deep Brew insights in many areas. I think it will play on IBM's business, Deep Blue, which was the computer that won the World Chess Championship a decade ago. I like Deep pilot. Brew. <laughs> Here, you can see four recommended choices for a Starbucks in Santa Monica. These aren't four fixed products I guess she's for not every in a Starbucks. Starbucks. She's somewhere Rather, else. Rather, they're selected by Deep Brew conference. after weighing many factors. She's making me hungry. What is popular at this specific store at this time of day, time of year? What's currently available in the store? even current weather conditions, and more. Mm. After I asked the drive through attendant for the cloud macchiato, the display shows me additional recommendations that Deep Brew knows are popular with those who have made the same choice as me under similar conditions. Not all Starbucks local markets are the same. Let me show you what you might see on the same day in Alaska. Notice that the choices are different, reflecting the unique local preferences for this Do you store really want that? and the recommendations. Do you really care what other customers are ordering, or do you just want to see what all your choices well. are? I don't. The recommendation engines are notoriously display, terrible. It's actually pretty tempting to me. Even if the they're good, I don't think I don't necessarily want them. I don't. The trade-off. I, I don't care what other people are ordering. Personal order history to make even more personal recommendations. Yeah. Deep Brew is a new platform for Starbucks. To innovate and experiment. But this is that's on Starbucks, not on Microsoft. Yeah. Microsoft's just showing how they can power this kind of thing. And those sous vide bites, they're very tasty. <laughs> you know, other people are ordering those. Yeah, I know. You should feel pretty that's good about I, yourself. That's why yeah. I wanted them. Yeah. Doesn't stop there. Olivia is going to show us how Starbucks is connecting Deep their essential through. coffee equipment in their 30,000 stores globally. Starbucks uses Azure to administer their connected coffee Azure equipment. sounds better in British. They're currently piloting mm. Azure, Azure IoT Central, Microsoft's hosted platform for IoT solutions to centralize some of this Is it work. Australian or British? As you can see, this She's Azure British. IoT Central dashboard shows data from the local Starbucks stores. Irish? Think of this as mission control no, I, for your morning coffee. I think she's pretty By much just English. By connecting the equipment to Azure IoT Central, Starbucks can monitor water temperature, pressure, pull time, and more to ensure their flagship Mastrainer 2 machines in stores are performing at their best to enable baristas to make the highest quality handcrafted beverages every time. Connecting the Mastrainer 2 to Azure IoT Central also allows Starbucks to run predictive maintenance models to more efficiently operate their machines. This device telemetry and predictive maintenance allows Starbucks to remotely diagnose potential problems, reduce maintenance costs, and most importantly, achieve higher customer satisfaction. What happens if you go to a Starbucks and the internet's down? None of this will work. <laughs> you just want my coffee. I just want a cup of coffee. Any IoT device to connect their equipment. They chose Azure Sphere, Microsoft's end-to-end -end solution for securely connected devices. Now we know how the Russians are going to influence our elections. They're just going to shut down the Starbucks. So some people are voting for, other people in your area are voting for. to their business. Starbucks can embed the Azure Sphere custom microcontroller into Slides new equipment. Slides Willer Remus tweets, vitally, Deep Brew OMG personalized it. recommendations for sous vide egg bites powered by AI and IoT. And as far as I can tell, this isn't even a joke. <laughs> Multiple times a year, Starbucks introduces new seasonal coffee. This and Bot tweets, if this Starbucks on Azure demo on mentions Game of Thrones, I'm going to lose it. Tens of thousands of USB sticks to be delivered to stores. Now the recipes can be delivered securely over the air from cloud to the Azure Sphere enabled device at the click of a button, which you can see in the Azure IoT Central Pilot, accelerating Starbucks innovation process from months to days and making the pathway for new innovation. Starbucks digital transformation is expanding beyond their Seattle offices and coffee shops to its vast supply chain, which starts at over 380,000 farms in nearly 30 countries. Starbucks recently previewed at its annual shareholders meeting a new digital transparency feature for customers. So, With I, this I've feature, done a lot of what I they call industrials, which are a code on this bag of coffee. basically working for the, companies the like Microsoft, HP, HP and others, hosting history, events and so forth. And this really is the bread and butter of enterprise computing is our see. partners. This is what our partners are doing. Uh, I don't know if so developers... 
We can see care what my, what grown. Starbucks is Starbucks doing because that's not anything they can regions. work on unless they work for Starbucks. But maybe it's maybe it's a demonstration of how the cloud, how Azure can be used in so many ways. Or if you're a developer and you're kind of considering which way to go, it's like here's Microsoft working with Starbucks, working with Walgreens, working with all these great companies so that might Starbucks well that's the yeah that's what enterprise companies do look at our partnerships yeah. Yeah. and mary joe's always talking about this and harping on it, how microsoft's now it's all about the partners thank you so much anita and olivia it's fantastic but i'm not sure that that's the speech that you know, developers want to see maybe it is but again maybe this is for the press by coffee for well and, brands, and uh, but I must say deep blue, honestly as a uh, i think is going to really remember the press i don't really care either I, it's uh, and I'm looking forward to it. And now I want to uh, switch to talking about AI because one of the key things that Azure has also been very focused on is how do we truly democratize access to AI? The breakthroughs are coming at amazing speed. In fact, just uh, even this year, Microsoft achieved human parity uh, in conversational So this Q&A. is interesting, but democratize AI. This has been a, another uh, and point for and that Nadell has been making lately, uh, is that and that's really what we're sometimes about, people really think that AI on. and everything in that's happening in AI is happening in Silicon Valley. And he really wants to emphasize that uh, Azure that in the cloud uh, uh, can make AI available uh, to a broad range of people. And I think that's very important. AI shouldn't have a point of view that's only in Silicon Valley. Support around inference, but it's both with Intel and NVIDIA is so important because we don't want that play of having frameworks to silicon we get to of some vertical integration that allow that just creates lock-in. So we really want to make sure that this infrastructure remains open and open standards. We're also investing to make sure that the tooling is making developers around AI and ML more productive. Uh, one of the things that you'll see in Azure ML advances is the no-code ML uh, tools. It's great to see that. Uh, but it's also the pipeline. Uh, the Azure DevOps is being extended for ML ops, or machine learning ops. And so it's fantastic to bring that same rigor of development and engineering and deployment uh, to uh, machine learning practices. Now, when it comes to services, uh, we continue to take the breakthroughs that we have across all of the various cognitive services and make them available to developers. Uh, there are advances throughout vision, speech, language, translation, uh, and a new service around decision. This is about reinforcement learning brought to anomaly detection and personalization, and it's really exciting to see this. Uh, we have many, many of these cognitive services, and the pattern of these cognitive services is to have them available in the cloud. You can customize them, especially the last layers. You can even put them in containers, take it to the edge devices, and of course, use the rich ML uh, tool chain around it. So that capability is what's driving uh, productivity. Now, one service I wanted to uh, showcase today is the Azure Speech Service. Uh, not only is the speech service getting better and better uh, when it comes to speech recognition. In fact, what you'll see in this demo is even for commodity hardware to replace any complex microarray setup so that your speech recognition is world class. But the most interesting thing is when you combine speech recognition with language models that are specific to It'll your be interesting organizational to compare data, this. You can start picking up all kind the turgid so imagine a prose with what Google says about AI has the tomorrow at Google to I.O. understand the local jargon that's specific to your organization, your industry, that, that way making the transcript that much more useful. So let's throw it uh, to our team uh, out on the gallery to show you Let's speech translation and transcription. Get this demo working. They kicked off this keynote with an attempt to demonstrate the HoloLens doing the moon landing from 1969 that failed entirely. Getting you. The prototype device connected to a cloud service that provided live transcription and translation. We are proud to announce today that we're making the conversation transcription capability within Azure Speech Services available as a preview release. Come on, let me show you. You might also remember this hardware from last year, which we're also making available as a developer device kit. 
But today, my colleagues and I are going to give you a demo of new research that we believe will make reading transcriptions <laughs> like more easily in available to everyone now. in the future. We are going to show you this demo using just the microphones built into this laptop and these two smartphones. This really highlights. Uh, With these, we create a <laughs> microphone array in the cloud. Why showmanship is fairly important in keynotes, and it's something Microsoft has, has not been good at ever since. Uh, also, you will notice Panay that and the I guy with a hat phone. stopped doing them. But the service can still recognize my <laughs> the voice. The guy with the hat. You know, the guy with a hat. Because I've given it permission the to hat use guy. my voice print to transcribe what I say. Now, the second thing we're going to show you so is that the I've been able to do this with my iPhone for about five years. <laughs> on the data in your company's Microsoft 365 tenant, so it can learn the unique vocabulary of your industry or company. This is available in private preview. Okay, so basically this is not for even the next public. two minutes, we're going to have a rap battle of sorts. But Ooh, for all of the geeks here okay, in so the room. Google has already so demonstrated this technology in public. Team, and he's going to give us an example of some dev speak. And Yusuf is in healthcare marketing. See, and ironically, he's dazzle us with a little bit of limited vocabularies like health jargon. and developers so are easier speak, for voice recognition, much easier on the screen, than general speech. So you can speech. see just how powerful so this, the service is. This is not is. necessarily Heiko, an impressive demo. Although it'd be fun to Azure see this. speech services are built with VMs rap. running on Azure hypervisors using Ubuntu-based Docker containers that are orchestrated with the Azure Kubernetes service. If they get Azure Kubernetes from what he just said, that'll be good. Oh, yeah, they did. Capabilities, including <laughs> ASR, Neural TTS, Microsoft Translator, and related custom services. You can access these using your favorite programming language, such as Java, JavaScript, Again, this is JS, actually C++, easier or C Sharp, and others. Than just general speech. The bar has been set. <laughs> okay, now it's your turn to give us a bit of this healthcare jargon. And it's been around for Microsoft literally decades. EHR integration through ISV vendors. Radiologists have been using Nuance Redox and other and voice via the HL7 uh, dictation fire uh, to dictate their HL7 fire is HIPAA, radiograph readings Marvie, for years. And GDPR compliant and is based on modern technology, including HTTPS okay. and RESTful protocols, as well as extensible APIs. The Fire open source community makes their source available on GitHub. And the Microsoft Teams Fire implementation is also aligned with Project Argonaut and follows the U.S. core profiles for all the Fire resources it consumes. Well, that was fun. <laughs> I'm going no, to call it that wasn't. a draw. <laughs> and it wasn't <laughs> rap, to be honest. A bit overboard there. We understand that this is incredibly important. Google can actually so transcribe rap, which is frankly far more impressive. Own specific jargon can have accurate transcriptions. We're really excited about where this work will take us, and our future ambition is to enable conversation transcriptions for anyone, anywhere, at any time. Thank you. That is Thank also you, fairly uh, lukewarm Sonia and applause. Yusuf. It's fantastic to see that language models, which are tenant-specific, come to life with speech recognition that's high quality, and I think that's going to be a really game-changer. Now, the other uh, service that has really uh, got tremendous momentum is these conversational interfaces that are being built using Bot Framework. In fact, 3,000 new bots uh, or conversational apps are getting created using this framework each week. And you will see in this conference many new features, everything from how to make the multi-turn dialogue much better and more robust, uh, how to take uh, in fact, Q and, the Q&A Maker uh, toolkit, which takes any PDF document and turns it into a conversational canvas capability. So lots and lots of new features. The language modeling uh, capabilities itself that are in, embodied with Lewis inside a bot framework are becoming much richer. Now, the most important thing, though, of the bot framework is the strategic importance for every business out there to build their own conversational canvas. Uh, just like you build websites, just like you build mobile applications, it becomes very important for every business out there to be in control of their own destiny when it comes to this new platform of conversations. The data, that is the conversation, is perhaps one of the most important pieces of data that all of you as developers as well as organizations have. So you want to ensure that the data is helping you, in fact, 
be in touch with your customers, your employees, and make them richer. And that's what you see. For example, BMW decided that they're going to own the personal assistant experience inside their car. Their brand needed to shine. And they're Lance building using the Lance pointing out on his Twitter feed assistant. that there was a little continuity error at the beginning of that speech demo. There was something on the desk. Using the bot framework because that's calls it Cortana's still mysterious so vision device. It was quickly removed before the actual yeah. demo began. I don't know if you can pick up my screen, Karsten. I don't know. I guess you can. But improve your service and products over time. And Coca-Cola is using it across a variety of functions internally wow. with their There's employees the, uh, from IT to HR device that was Im immediately so removed. <laughs> Probably, I don't know if it was left there by accident or if they were trying to tell people something. I'm not really sure what. You building that capability it's a good catch by Lance Ulanov. Almost as good as the uh, Starbucks uh, cup so in the uh, Game of Thrones episode that. last night. <laughs> I now, didn't see we that. Also have oh, yeah. Mixed reality services. <laughs> Which are, if you think about That's AI, not a spoiler. HoloLens 2 is the I don't think it was a plot point. AI Where the, was it? I mean, Aria, device, uh, not Aria. Which also um, happens to be the edge for action. Danny, at the, uh, fact, at the banquet, the where they're all getting drunk. And how it's Everybody's drinking out of horns. She was drinking out of a Starbucks really cup. Amazing to see it's on the table. The combination of Azure yeah, a little, little mistake. <laughs> These things happen. Really it's very chaotic. <laughs> more polygons than ever before Did, did people call her Danny, really? Or you Danny, yeah. yeah. You don't call her Danny? I well, you kind of have to know her. I don't know her. games and the Unreal team have done, in that case, to be able to enable the next generation of mixed reality experiences. We also have now Azure services, such as the Spatial Anchor service, uh, which allow you to build cross-device mixed reality experiences. So mixed reality to us is going to be something that's going to happen across Azure and Azure Edge, uh, across HoloLens 2 and Azure, but also all the other devices and Azure. Uh, to enable, for example, next generation of training, next I hope somebody's generation counting of how many times they say the word Azure in this mm -hmm. is using it to change training applications inside the organization, make it much more possible for people to ramp up quickly. Or the best uh, drinking Philips game. Philips is using it for non-invasive surgery. Uh, PTC is using it for industrial design. This is so these all are about all partners. applications that are getting built using mixed reality. And we are very excited to see what happens at this build and this next coming year in terms of really the exploitation of both Azure uh, as well as HoloLens 2. The new area for us is autonomous systems. Now, the autonomy is, comes in two forms. One is you watch things move or you enable things to move. And both of these are important. And so the set of services that we're launching are really the combination of simulation tools, because one of the keys for building autonomous system is your ability to have great simulation capability, uh, as well as we are bringing a new technique around machine teaching. So how do you take domain experts, take them their expertise, and help teach these machines to be able to calibrate so that you can create autonomy? And those are the two sets of things that we are doing beyond what is available, obviously, with cognitive services. Uh, and, and you already see these uh, early examples. Toyota material handling is a great example where you have these pallets that are autonomous. And what they have done is to use AirSim and our simulation capability to create that autonomy. Uh, Shell is using our new machine teaching services, as well as reinforcement learning, in order to do precision drilling. So how do you take what is a very complex uh, task and really solidify, industrialize it uh, by creating this brain out of basically reinforcement learning and machine teaching? Same thing with Schneider Electric. In this case, it's about managing the temperature of rooms by sensing people in space or not. Uh, so this is a control system, but now you have an autonomous control system loop, which is really being driven by this machine teaching with reinforcement learning. So we are very excited about the types of apps uh, and the possibilities of what happens with the simulation capabilities as well as machine teaching. Now, that's a quick rundown of Azure. And as I said, uh, Scott's going to talk a lot more this afternoon about it. But I want to move to this next platform area, which is Dynamics 365 and Power Platform. 
If there's no, anything more exciting than Azure, me, it's Dynamics 365 as our platform. Whenever I go to anywhere in the United States or anywhere in the world, the one thing that I have the real privilege of is to meet with developers, independent software developers, who are building business applications. <laughs> This category. Why are you banging on your surface? Because it's just stopped working. The keyboard stopped working. The oh, okay. uh, it's just not. Uh, it really sort of shines the light that there is a I lot of innovation kind of sweet. happening you, beyond you the West. Drag that thing out of the dust, dust, dust balls and the moth balls and yeah. brought it out for your show today. And, and that's why I think well, I'm going to have uh, Alcantara on a keyboard if I'm going to be so sitting important. here for that long. Yeah. Dynamics 365 has been completely rewritten to be an Azure cloud native app. In fact, there will be a lot of sessions at this conference where we're going to talk about how it's been built. Uh, for microservices, completely ground up, how it's natively built for the Azure database, as well as Cosmos DB. Uh, the, everything about the architecture of Dynamics 365 itself is an amazing template for all of those who built SQL Server applications in the past and now are becoming multi-tenant SaaS applications. Uh, it's a unified solution. It's got AI built in. But most importantly is its extensibility framework through Power Platform. One of the hardest challenges for business applications has always been because there's no such thing as a canonical business process. It always changes by industry, and more importantly, it changes in time because the businesses are not constant. So how do you deal with the customization? How do you deal with even IP from multiple ISVs in a particular instance. It's that N-way customization with upgradability. And those are some of the things that really Power Platform along with Dynamics 365 solves. Now what that means is there's tremendous amount of traction uh, for Dynamics today. There's 90% of the Fortune 500 are using Dynamics or Power Platform. But the most interesting thing is the number of ISVs. Uh, who are building on top of both Power Platform uh, and Dynamics all over the world. Uh, and now the stack, I think, is the most important thing here, which is you not only have access as developers to the richness of Azure, everything in Azure infrastructure, data, AI, but now you can rely on the common data model, which is a bootstrap for all of the business process automation. To that, you can add your own entities, your own data, on top of that, you have the power platform that you can embed inside your own application. That means it's the workflow engine, it's the power apps, forms engine, um, as well as Power BI, which is the analytics engine. So any SaaS application can use the same extensibility framework and then use Dynamics 365's modular architecture as you need. So that's why we see ISVs who build all the way to the top or all the way to the bottom of the stack. And in fact, most ISVs will use the combination of all these layers to be able to build their application. So this is what we see at scale. And in fact, just to give you a couple of examples, AdV is um, a media buying solution out of Australia. They have built on top of Dynamics and Power Platform. Uh, Anara is building a solution for automotive, uh, and this is for fleet management and equipment rental companies inside of the automotive industry. They built on top of Dynamics 365. It's all and partners all again, the way down. BI, <laughs> services, uh, and integrating with Dynamics. Uh, we also have Indigene, which is uh, a life sciences uh, solution uh, that's built on top of Dynamics 365. And Adobe is incorporating Power BI and the rest of Power Platform as part of their SaaS application. So it shows the combination of techniques being used by ISVs to incorporate business process automation as part of their applications. One of the other things that we're also doing is the Open Data Initiative in combination, in partnership with Adobe and SAP. Because one of the challenges organizations have as they adopt more SaaS apps is sometimes they create new silos. It's your data, it's your organizational data, whether it's about customers or suppliers or your own employee information. But when it goes to a SaaS application, or in fact, worse yet, if it goes into some marketing campaign in some, uh, or, you know, in, in some channel, they become very opaque to you. So the goal is to be able to make sure that all this data is in control by you. 
And that's what the Open Data Initiative is all about. Open Data Initiative starts with a data model that allows you to take data from these SaaS applications, enrich them using things like Azure Data Lake and all of the AI techniques, and then put the data back in side of the really SaaS applications. It's really interesting. Satya is so uh, it allows you to deeply attached to this stuff and really enthusiastic and about it. He loves Azure, where you can and he can clearly talk the talk on this. He's really, frankly, much more it's not about just compelling and uh, fluid and when he's talking about this than when he's talking about ethics and vision and mm -hmm. security and privacy. He's getting into it. ...to improve the outcomes in the other, and that's what the architecture of ODI enables. And in fact, you see this with what Unilever was able to do. Uh, it's a great example where they took some of the sustainability work they were doing, digitized it, used, in this case, SAP transactional information, as well as all the things that Azure provides from an Azure Data Lake site. But the most interesting thing is they said, okay, if we're going to do all this around sustainability, what if we translated that into a campaign on the front end uh, using Adobe so that we can even help educate uh, and market to people on their audience who care about sustainability. So the combination of that is what was really amazing to see with Unilever, where they broke free of any one silo and were able to bring all of the data to bear to improve what their business outcome is. Now, that's about Dynamics uh, 365 and Power Platform. As I said, it's great to think about this as an another first class part of our stack as you think about your application development, because, because business process automation is so key and part of every application. Now, switching to Microsoft 365. Microsoft 365 is the world's productivity cloud across work and life. It's that core communications, collaboration, productivity scaffolding that spans work and life. It also acts as the scaffolding for business process workflow because it creates the opportunity for your business applications to drive so much more engagement by really using this UI that's in front of users all day long for their communication needs. It also is the security uh, endpoint and device as well as uh, applications. And so it's, it's a very comprehensive solution and it's got the, the main thing about Microsoft 365 is it's about starting by putting people at the center and then thinking about all of their activities across applications, across devices. Right? That's the real change in how we think about uh, end user computing going forward. Not starting from the device and then working forwards, but really thinking about the person and all the applications and all the devices in their life. That's the paradigm for Microsoft 365. And you see the, you know, what the, the way it manifests in terms of developer opportunity is with Microsoft Graph. So as things move to things like Office 365, what happens is a very rich database gets created, a database that is about people, their relationships with other people, their artifacts, whether it's their schedules, documents, uh, projects, all of that is available as a first class database structure for you. And now, not only is there Microsoft Graph, but it's these rich canvases, whether it's Windows, Office, Edge, and Teams. So it's that combination platform opportunity that I want to talk about. Now, the, later this afternoon, Rajesh Jha will also be talking about all of the new capabilities across Windows, Office, Teams, Edge, and many of these capabilities. But I want to highlight a few things. Starting Another in slide fact, with a thousand fact, entries <laughs> no one can read. Customer momentum. The world's brands are using well, uh, my, my, yeah, Microsoft 365 worse. today. And it's exciting to see even how some ISVs are using the Microsoft Graph. One of the announcements uh, at this conference is how Microsoft Graph is now available through Azure Data Connect. I think it's going to be very ISVs interesting to compare this talk, granted by organizations, which is developer-focused, so although more partner-focused, to what Google an HR does tomorrow. Application provider out of I France, think it will be a little more likely. And they are working with Christine Dior to fill out right, their we'll teams and some hardware profiles probably. by using the Microsoft Graph More data compelling that demos, that demos that actually data. work. So that's a good canonical um, example of how graph <laughs> data can enable work. even a business application vendors. Uh, and we think of this as a very rich ecosystem that's developing. Now, in fact, you see this 
even inside of Microsoft 365's own first party apps. Microsoft Search, which brings universal search capability, is built on same the graph structure. I love, uh, I do have to say, I love his enthusiasm. Uh, really keeps track when he's talking about this stuff. It's a very different such an Adele. To make sure that he my really enjoys this. Things that matter the most. Uh, that's another example of a productivity tool, but it's a tool that's built using the graph data. Cortana is another example of that, uh, where we are really building out Cortana as a conversational interface for Microsoft 365 by really reasoning on top of that's the That's an interesting data. change in Cortana. They've moved Cortana, it out of the, the core Cortana consumer products, really and, they, and they've really made it a business product. On features mm -hmm. like time to leave in Outlook is driven by Cortana, gives you heads up. It's just so every different than I an Apple keynote. I mean, Steve Jobs, uh, I mean, not Steve Jobs, but I, Tim I Cook is such a like Southern so preacher kind of, I'm going to like convince you of something where he's task, more of a professor. Like, like we're talking about stuff you understand and I'm going to explain it to you. It's an enterprise company and this is an enterprise talk. Honestly, it's as Microsoft kind of abandoned its consumer uh, facing so stuff, it really does make sense. Skill, you're, you're not going to see any talk about Surface here or barely anything about Windows. And by the way, the same skill building using bot framework, you can wire it into any other uh, assistant as well. So that's a way for you to think about your skills. Now, this is great. This is really progressing. But one of the things we are also hard at work at is to say, OK, if this is the first innings of what is conversational canvases, what's going to come next? Now, in spite of all the progress, you've got to remember, today, most of the conversations that we have are still very brittle. They're truly not multi-turn. The context from turn to turn gets lost, especially when you, you know, human language is complex. Uh, it's complex where the context sometimes is subtle. So therefore, how do you make sure that the natural language capabilities okay, inside this, of these personal This might be an interesting demo. Let's watch this Cortana demo. That shared context across a long dialogue versus just a, a few turns. The second real challenge is today, most of these assistants are command systems where you have to invoke these skills one at a time. What if we can imagine a future where you can cross domains without having to invoke each skill by name? So what is a true multi-domain assistant? And of course, lastly, most importantly, we need a multi-agent world. The idea that you're always going to start with one wake word and one assistant is just not like how we start on the web, this for example. This is how just you imagine, talk if you what lost is, this what is an open race and uh, Echo or Google has won it. Like. Cortana is a weak, distant force. <laughs> That's what now we're going to be multi-agent. <laughs> uh, when it comes to the personal assistant. Poor so Cortana. In fact, last year we bought a company called Semantic Machines uh, that you know, had fantastic natural language uh, researchers and experts. They, along with the rest of Microsoft research community, and it's really puzzling that Microsoft, Microsoft just like they lost the phone, you know, the mobile space, future, completely uh, fumbled this floor, speech space. See some of the demos that manifest this, but I wanted to roll a video to showcase this video. Is Tom Warren saying, video. "Watch this; it's going to be good." What do I have today? Here's what your day looks like. Today you have Notice take she didn't a walk say, outside hey, at 8 a.m. You're one on one with Anjali at 10 a.m. Lunch with Tom at noon, and your app kickoff at 3 p.m. Uh, go ahead and reschedule my walk to tomorrow at the same time. Sure, I can move take a walk outside to tomorrow at 8 a.m. Is that right? Yeah, that sounds great. Okay, I've moved it to tomorrow. And schedule a cram session with Nicholas and his manager from 9 to 1.30 today. And uh, we're going to need a room in Bellevue. Oh, OK. I'll invite Nicholas Cohn and Michelle Estes to the cram session. And I'll put your meeting in City Center 2605. Does that look good to you? Yeah. And push back my one-on-one -on -one with Anjali to tomorrow. All right, I've booked I your meeting. I never do any of this stuff. And here is it just are that my life is less interesting? <laughs> well, you have to have all the so information in the, day? In the Let's there. see. Yeah. How about this one? First. Yeah, that'll work. And is she invited to the app kickoff this afternoon? They're showing off, of course. No, she's not on the How invite. they know context she 
refers to somebody okay. earlier in the. I forwarded the app kickoff to Anjali Bot. Great. Oh, right. After my last meeting today, I scheduled 30 minutes to pick up the birthday cake. Sure. Pick up the birthday cake at 4 p.m. Is that right? This yep. woman has a very I busy me, wife. Where is my lunch meeting today? Lunch with Tom is at Liberty Cafe. What's the weather going to be like? It'll be mostly sunny and 71 degrees <laughs> at Liberty Cafe. Look at the freaking window, lady. <laughs> Why do I have to walk so far? <laughs> yes. Liberty Cafe has outdoor seating. <laughs> Am I walking in circles? Car. This is Connecting okay. to car skills. This is now a Saturday Night sure. Live sketch. Directions to Liberty Cafe have been sent to your car. Why is the sky blue? When's our next review with Cyrus? Your next quarterly review with Cyrus Nafani is Tuesday, June 11th at 10 a.m. Why do my children hate me? Dry run with Benjamin McIntosh the Friday before that. All right. Does this work for you? Yep. What could you do great. about this lump on my I've neck? I scheduled your dry run with Benjamin. Thank you. Happy to help. Oh, and now people arrive. <laughs> I am not used to talking to humans. Okay, that... First of all, it's completely canned, so you have no idea if it really worked, if it really happened. We are very excited to continue to push towards this future with Cortana and Bot Framework, true multi-turn, multi-domain, multi-agent world. Now switching to talk about the canvas, starting with Windows and Office. Now one of the great opportunities that is in front of us with over 800 million Windows 10 devices, as well as a, a billion Office 365 and Microsoft 365 endpoints across devices, is the opportunity for developers who have written applications for these platforms to extend their reach. Every app, whether it's a Win32 app, whether it's a WPF app, a UWP app, any app can be annotated with graph data. And all of these applications can also now incorporate natural user interface, whether it's speech, Windows, hello, ink. And that's what we see with developers. Uh, so for example, uh, with Windows developers, Fluid Math has built a fantastic educational app with great inking support to teach math. Uh, Concepts, which is a drawing application, in fact, uses both uh, inking as well as the surface dial to bring their applications to life. And when it comes to office extensibility, for example, SurveyMonkey, you know, in situ in an Outlook email, even on a phone, uh, can do the survey because of these action cards that are built into Outlook. Uh, <laughs> Bloomberg's taken all of their rich service and data and incorporated all it into Excel using the Excel All I heard was something about SurveyMonkey in situ, uh, Outlook, so that just shows email. You how Office it's just word salad to me now. I... Or application development in Windows gets richer uh, across all of the frameworks that you may have used because of the graph as well as natural user interface. So that's how we he think could be about making the future it up of Windows and Office development. <laughs> I don't know if we'd know. Now, I want to talk about Edge and what we're doing with web. You know, one See of the if things he calls it, it, it that would be so cool. <laughs> really a set of commitments we are making to the web and web development. It starts with open source. In fact, Edge is built on Chromium. Uh, we are fully participating in the OSS community there. Uh, we've already made contributions around ARM64 support. Uh, we're also bringing accessibility support uh, to the code base so that all browsers built on the Chromium project can benefit this is from it. Actually, good. Uh, this we'll, is we brought touch Microsoft doing what Apple's not very so good at doing, which is contributing back, back to the open source the project open source it's using. Community so that all browsers built on that code base can gain, improve and get better. Apple's often it also dinged for the lack of the commitment. Upstream to truly commitments, cross commits to uh, We're going to have Darwin. Edge on Windows 10. We're going to have Edge on Windows 7, Edge on iOS and Android, and so we're going to ha and, and the Mac. And we're going to have support for all platforms. That means end users are going to be able to use one browser across their work and life. This is great for both developers as well as IT professionals. So that's our su support and commitment uh, for cross-platform. 
But we're also committed to innovating on the web. One of the things that we're very excited about is to, oh, so before I go to innovation, let me talk about privacy and security, because we're really committed to ensuring that the transparency and choice is there for anyone browsing, because the most important thing is to show, make sure that all the data that's being tracked and collected on the web is something that is first very much transparent to the end user, and the end user is in control about their own privacy and security. And so we want to make sure that we are pushing uh, the envelope on that. And on top of that, we also want to make sure we are innovating on the web. Uh, when it comes to innovation, the first area we are focused on is collaboration. We believe we can, in fact, bring the next generation of real-time collab to the web. But these distributed data structures that are client-side with a cloud relay, we believe we can bring collaboration. I love distributed data structures, cloud-side with the cloud, client-side with the cloud relay. That is how I order my Starbucks every morning. Uh, other people are ordering the same yeah. thing. Half-calf, half-decaf, distributed data structures with a client-side cloud. This is so good. Oh, boy. Let's run the gauntlet. I don't know what that was about. Thank you, Satya. Hi, everyone. I'm Divya Kumar from the Microsoft Edge team. I know most of you are already trying out the early previews and have started giving us feedback, so thank you. Today, I'm going to show experiences we're working on in three areas. How Edge will offer a seamless web experience for enterprises how we're thinking about approaching privacy, and how we can help improve productivity on the web. Let's start with enterprise. Organizations are looking for ways to better connect their employees with resources. The new tab page on Microsoft Edge that's customizable by IT shows kind of hard me to believe, my most we're only recently used in. documents hmm. and other corporate resources hmm. so they're just a click away. And with Microsoft even. Search, I think which is an enterprise late. search yeah. offering, yeah, using minutes. Bing Technology yeah. and Microsoft yeah. Graph, mm -hmm. Edge can show me contextually relevant search results from my, my organization. My says it's 5 p.m. So. Let's say I'm looking for my vacation <laughs> tracking tool. In, in 1970. You can see that it's the yeah. results and even includes a snapshot. But what we're excited to announce today is that Edge will offer built-in support for Internet Explorer. Over Wait a minute. 60 percent of enterprises <laughs> worldwide Is that inception? use IE Edge because will they offer have internal sites that require legacy Explorer. compatibility. Today, if I were to open this site in an older version of the browser, ah. a separate IE window this would open. This is what open. Microsoft's I'll so good at. i forced to switch back and forth between two browsers where one has my favorite history and the other doesn't. People who still it's have to use IE 8. So we fixed it. Now when I click this link, the site opens in the same window oh, man, and in the same tab. All of a sudden, we're transported back to 1997. <laughs> so no more jarring experiences when you hit an internal site that needs Internet Explorer. The combination of compatibility, customizability, and legacy support makes this a fantastic choice for enterprises. Now let's talk about privacy. We get a range of reactions from customers when talking about how their browsing data is used across the web. Let's take targeted ads, for example. Some find it valuable, some find it creepy, and some just don't care. Hmm. We're True. exploring simple tools that let you control. That pretty much yeah. boils it down. Three, uh, Here's a feature we're working on. In the privacy and security settings, I find settings, it creepy I and I don't options. care. Depending on which option and I, find I it pick, valuable. Edge adjusts how third parties can track me across the web. Unrestricted is a great option if you're fine with how things work today. Strict is a good option for those who would prefer to block all third party trackers, even if that means some limitations. The balance setting blocks trackers from sites you haven't visited or don't give you the right level of transparency or control of your data. Regardless of which you choose, Edge will block malicious trackers. While browsing on the site, I can click on the lock icon, and it tells me exactly what setting I'm on. And you can see that I'm on balance. And I can see the number of trackers that are allowed and number of trackers that are blocked. Privacy is a sensitive issue. 
And we think it's meaningful to empower you through transparency and a few added controls. Now let's move on to productivity. When I research on the web, it can be a really manual process. I can have dozens of tabs open. I've got multiple windows all arranged carefully so I can compare things. I can take screenshots for sharing. I'm copying and pasting content into documents. It can be pretty tedious. We're working on a feature called Collections. It helps me gather, organize, and share content more efficiently. I can launch Collections by clicking on the icon on the top right. You can see that I've already created a few collections. But what I personally love about collections, besides the ability to collect different types of content as I'm browsing the web, is that I can email my collections directly from Edge. I can copy and paste an entire collection into other apps. I can even export it to Word and Excel. And Edge does all the formatting for me. I'll start a new collection so you can see how it works. It's bookmarks I'm on actually steroids. looking for a camera for my niece and trying to collect some photography tips. So here I am uh, on a page. As I look, I can start to drag and drop content. And I can also switch tabs. And I can drag and drop text as well. And once I'm done looking at uh, the content that I have, I can uh, choose from one of the options that I've got. So you can see I can email, copy the clipboard. But I'm going to go with Export to Word and show you how it works. It's like Edge Google creates Keep. a clean document, <laughs> even automatically. Yeah, I mean, call it nice Edge feature. citations. Keep. Keep. Yeah. How cool it's is a, that? It's a nice feature. Now let me open another collection I'd started earlier, so you can see how Export to Excel works. These are some it of the reminds me a little bit of Sets, which is something Microsoft earlier. trumpeted, going said they were going to put in, share, demonstrated, and Export then decided to not to do. Collections does all the copy and pasting for me and categorizing That's for nice. me into a table if you like that lets me do quick side-by-side -side comparison. That's good. It does this using the metadata that accompanies the site or content I collected. This shows how serious we are about innovating on the web beyond just delivering on compatibility. We think these experiences are valuable to how we use the web today. And we look forward to evolving them with your feedback on the PC and on the phone. And now, Mike Morton from the Office Engineering team is going to introduce you to something we're calling Fluid Framework that works cross-browser. Over to you, Mike. Thanks, Divya. Today, it is my honor to represent the Microsoft 365 team and introduce the Fluid Framework. The Fluid Framework is a new set of technologies that developers can use to build experiences for any browser that break down barriers between people and barriers between apps. It allows people to work in fundamentally new ways. We are excited to share with you a sneak preview of how Fluid may change the way you work with Microsoft 365 apps like Word, Teams, and Outlook. This will include hyper-fast co-authoring, AI and bots that collaborate with you, and components that make it easy to reuse content across tools. I'll start with a very simple scenario, co-authoring a document. Let me type just a little bit of text. Is he, is he saying Great. that? When Fluid powers co-authoring, collaboration feels like immersive, is. natural, and smooth. <laughs> My colleague Chica here is typing on a machine backstage. So this Her is session a, is going through a, a data center is, in the Central United States. Fluid is a collaboration set. Chica is working tools. in one of these four browsers. You'll notice Edge and Chrome both on the screen. But it is so fast, you might not actually be able to tell which one. She's actually using the Edge browser in the upper left. I'm going to go ahead and bring a pen here. Inking is even more latency sensitive. I'm going to do some quick drawing. Each of my key uh, drawings is, takes up quite a bit more data than regular plain text. It's interesting, because these you are the kinds of tools that side by Microsoft side mine. has had for some time in so OneNote it's hard collaboration to see the tools. As we draw. Fluids I'm not sure if they're taking them out of OneNote device, and putting them throughout the operating system scenarios. or if they're just collaboration parallel is developments. not just about people working together, but a combination of people working together with AI. I'm going to do a little bit more text typing here. Great. As I was typing that text, hopefully you noticed that it was being translated into nine different languages, one of the each screens that you have over above. This is just one example of That's bots participating cool. as collaborators in Fluid. Wow. Fluid will enable scenarios where we have tens 
or even hundreds of agents helping users in areas such as proofing, data insights, design ideas, security scanning, and much, much more. I'd now like to show you Fluid Components. Here I have a document, and I want to go ahead and copy a table and get some input from the team members. I can go ahead and paste it into a conversation here. Um, because it's a Fluid Component, we can, we can continue to collaborate on it, even across apps. I can even go ahead and filter it down to just what's relevant for the conversation. This and hide the column. Um, you'll see that uh, Cheek is actually backstage editing data. Of course, I can edit data right here in the main document. And what's happening, one of us is working in Teams, Chica backstage. I'm working in Word. And together, we're collaborating on the same data on the same underlying table. All right, let's go back to the document here. And I'll go ahead and insert a chart. When I insert a chart, you'll actually see a set of recommended charts. This is an example of a collaborative bot analyzing the data and providing intelligence on what visualization would work out best. I'll go ahead and choose this chart here. And I can even add a formula in line in my document. I'll go ahead and summarize or do a sum um, of the number of units being delivered. And I'll click Enter and kind of scroll up. And again, I can continue to change numbers. Cheeky can change numbers backstage. And you'll see the, uh, the chart, the formula, and the underlying table all being updated in real time. Um, you may have noticed that I got a little email notification from, uh, from Chica while we're um, uh, working. Uh, the Fluid Framework isn't just about new apps like Teams, but it can be integrated into almost any application experience. I'll go ahead and click on this message here. And you'll see this is not just an ordinary table. This is a Fluid component. It's collaborative, and it's updating in real time. This scenario with Word, Teams, and Outlook shows Fluid aiding productivity by providing low latency collaboration, AI co-authors, and embeddable components. Thank you so much for letting us share an early preview of the Fluid Framework. Later this year, this technology will come to Microsoft 365 Experiences and be exposed to developers through an SDK. Back to you, Sacha. That SDK is important because if it's just an office, that's going to have much more limited you, use Vivian than if Mike. I think the world people is can ready write stuff for that'll another choice be when part it comes of it. to web and innovation. We are very, very excited the real about framework both has to be Edge as well as the Fluid Framework and what developers can do with it. Now I want to move to Teams. Uh, Teams, by far, in my own experience at, at Microsoft, is the fastest growing application uh, that I've seen. Uh, it's tremendous to see its growth, but one of the most interesting things is the opportunity it creates for developers. When you think about Teams, it's a scaffolding that has four capabilities built into it. It has messaging, it has video conferencing and meetings, it has collaboration, as well as the ability to integrate any business process workflow. All these four things are possible using the team scaffolding. And we are seeing tremendous adoption across customers. And one of the things that really Teams for the first time has shown is that Microsoft 365 toolchain is not just for the knowledge workers. In fact, some of the fastest growing use cases in Microsoft 365 is what we describe as first line usage. So this is retail specialists, people on the factory floor, on, in the hospitals using Teams. Uh, some examples, Hendrik Sports is using it for their NASCAR training uh, team. Uh, uh, Marks and Spencers is using it for the retail specialists in the stores. Uh, NHS is using it to bring care coordination uh, in their hospitals. So these are amazing examples of how Teams and the four capabilities all light up. Uh, to enable this. And to show you all of the new capabilities and features in Teams, as well as the rich hardware ecosystem opportunity and how that is developing around Teams and some of the new innovation, I wanted to invite up on stage Rana Amjadi from our Teams organization. Come on up. Thanks, Satya. Thank you. Microsoft Teams was designed to foster an inclusive work culture for every worker from the C-suite to the first line. This first line area of the workforce, like retail associates or factory technicians, has traditionally been underserved by technology. But we're working hard to change that. Earlier this year, we introduced the team's mobile first line experience. You can see here, first line workers, they're often usually the first to respond when something goes awry. Now they can take a picture of the situation using the smart camera, annotate it, add some context, and in this situation, and it's an it's animated GIF on the entire <laughs> Teams thread. 
Some if eggs are broken. Are Someone do something about it. Make what it can we do? Fix it, please. <laughs> they can also share the location, making it easier to keep track of deliveries or meet up with a team. Did she say, I'll be there in 30 minutes? <laughs> Those eggs everything. are going to be <laughs> hard as a rock. All right from the phone. I want the job. Now, I want that job. Being, yeah. Having to Egg say, yeah, some eggs are broken. Somebody do something about it. Teams. <laughs> we focus on making the meetings experience more inclusive and hassle-free with live captions that make it easier for everyone to engage in the conversation. With customized backgrounds that help you minimize the distractions behind you. Pretend you're on the beach, or pretend you're in the office if you're actually on the beach. Teams will also help you find meeting rooms based on your proximity, making it easier for you and your team to just hop into a quick huddle. And you'll have the full immersive meeting experience with multiple video streams, like Brady Bunch style. But what would a keynote be without a little bit of magic? People joining the meeting remotely should feel as included in the discussion, even if the team is brainstorming on a whiteboard. So by simply connecting a USB webcam to the Teams room, using AI, the room will find the whiteboard image and straighten it to make it more legible. It also detects people and makes them transparent. So if someone walks in front of the whiteboard to write something, the team online will be able to see right through them, like literally right through them. <laughs> it's pretty cool. And all of these features have been designed to work best with our ecosystem of Teams devices, making meetings and callings experiences better in conference rooms, at your desk, and on the go. It's been so incredible to see what you've been building with our apps across so many categories and industries. Whether you're using Office 365 apps, any of our hundreds of partner apps, or building your own, Teams unifies all of these experiences into one hub. And it's up to you to choose how to bring that to life for your organization, whether that's through developing your own solutions and using Power Apps to integrate workflows, or surfacing actionable canvases to meet your users where you are. Now, Rajesh will go much deeper into how to build custom apps for Teams in the Microsoft 365 keynote. But all of these points draw on the Microsoft graph, opening up a wide range of possibilities for empowering your people and your organization. This is the power of the Teams platform, and we're so excited to see what you build next. Now, let's check out how one of our partners, Spatial, has teamed up with Mattel to build custom solutions using HoloLens and Microsoft 365 to make collaboration a more immersive experience. Let's head to the showcase floor. Thanks. Intermission? What? Let's all go to Thank the you, lobby. I'm excited to show you, our fellow developers, how we at Spatial have been able to enrich our existing holographic collaboration app with HoloLens 2, Azure Spatial Anchors, the Microsoft made, Graph, uh, and Teams. I Father Robert do this last year. We were year. really blown away by how I'm quick and easy it was to use these simple year. APIs to make Spatial <laughs> even more useful for our customers by leveraging the power of the Microsoft Graph that they are already running their businesses on. For example, we're going to show you how our customer Mattel ideates, designs, and collaborates across global borders on multiple brands that we all know and love, like Hot Wheels, Barbie, and Fisher Price. Let's take a look. So I'm going to jump onto my PC here, and I'm already in a Teams channel. And I can see Amanda's posted some cool new content. But why don't we upgrade this to a live spatial meeting to get everyone on the same yeah, page? Yeah, let's I'm upgrade this to a live click spatial, over to spatial mm -hmm. tab in Teams. That's a spatial and I get this meeting. This really cool 3D dollhouse view. I'm going to click oh, into the room no. where I can see everybody. But since I have a HoloLens 2 here, why don't I take this off a 2D screen into a 3D meeting? All I have to do is scan the QR code in the corner. I'm going to put on the device. Scan the code. This really is go. a dystopian vision of the future. I'm sorry. Hey, Amanda, what's up? It looks like you're already in here. Yep, I'm here in my office, also wearing a HoloLens 2. So you'll see me in the room. Also really hoping this doesn't fail like the last one. <sighs> and all of our content that you just saw from that team oh. channel is already up here on the wall. Oh, look at the arms. You can, you can see, see them the through her body. The That's Microsoft so Graph weird. API. Cool. Does it look like her? And with the new finger hand tracking in oh. HoloLens 2, 
it's so easy to quickly. This reminds me of Dev Null. So I can this is basically the same technology we were using 25 years and ago. Toss it right up there on our shared workspace, so we can all take a look. Karsten looked familiar, doesn't it? I want a man to check out something. It sure I can, does. Could you spin his hair? It looks exactly like Dev Null. tour. What do you think of that one, Amanda? Wow, Why'd you put it on me? Great. Get it off of me. And just to recap what happened. Get it off here, of me. I got a holographic oh, image on the wall hey, as a real person spinning. in this room <laughs> and threw it to an avatar who could be anywhere in the world. Wow, this is awesome. No, it's now, not. With the new hand tracking capabilities <laughs> in the mixed reality toolkit, I can also have this cool new hand dock. So let's pull it up and it lets me pull up. My cool new hand dock. Like my OneDrive. <laughs> I'm just going to scroll. Can I show you my cool new hand stock? <laughs> and select Sky Justice. I think you're going to like it. There we go. And let's make this life size. No, let's not. Oh, that's and terrifying. Up a little bigger. And you Is know, Sky Amanda, Justice I'm something thinking, that I should know? Uh, show if you were in part of the Mattel and give her some universe, you might. Absolutely. I think she really could use a bracelet. <laughs> and What's wrong course, with her arm? Touch, a hollow <laughs> Everyone needs oh, a good. HoloLens. Yeah, yeah this awesome. is really good. Oh, oh hey, Lynn. Oh, like no, joined. this is terrible. Hello, everyone. I love this. Joining from my PC, I love I'm this. still able to participate in the experience. That's what it says on my prompter. So are you ready to see what I've been working on? No. Yeah, let's check it out. Since I've joined from my laptop via the spatial tab in Teams you saw earlier, I can easily browse and upload content directly from my PC and upload it to the meeting. Check out this 3D model of a hover pad. Sweet. <laughs> this is cool. You know, Amanda, <laughs> since this is mixed reality, why don't you uh, jump in and give it a spin? Of course. Let's try it out. <laughs> Dead Eye Amanda is now going to get oh, in. Oh, it's even cooler on the inside. <laughs> now, <laughs> now sp spatial is a hardware agnostic even, platform. You even this guy is realizing <laughs> this is uh, not good. Sure, let me invite Jacob onto the stage. Now he's going to show you how you can I join. I can't wait to see the Reddit content. memes. Oh, this is so dope. I love it. Oh, no, it's not Great dope. Great work, Lynn. Not dope With Azure all. Spatial Anchors, this mixed reality experience shows a map across HoloLens and AR Kit and AR Core. This means that I could have the most immersive experience on a HoloLens, or I can use this Android phone here to not only see what everyone else is seeing, but actively participate and modify the content as well. Nice. Thanks, guys. I just Solid don't see and, uh, really anybody replacing the normal the team, tomorrow. team meetings now, if you haven't this. done so already, I would really encourage you to integrate I, your app uh, with I wouldn't mind it. Graph. All we had to do to make this whole experience a reality <laughs> it's just because you don't want to come to work. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it leverages all the power of Microsoft 365. Oh, that's so and dope. And developers, if you've been waiting to jump aboard the mixed reality train, now is the time because the HoloLens 2 <laughs> is sweet. You can now reach out <laughs> so to the for the first time, and it is so cool. It's Add so on the power sweet. of it's Azure cool. Spatial Anchors, and you get the ability to extend your experience to any device. So AR developers can embrace AR regardless of the device oh, they choose, guy whether does it's HoloLens, mobile, or anything in between. All right, well, thank you for having us, and come experience this all firsthand I at think the Spatial Booth in Hall 4 wall, and back to you, Satya. Thank you so much. Oh, boy. <laughs> thank you so much, Rana, Amanda, Anna, Jacob, and Jacob, and Lynn. It's fantastic to see the entirety of the stack come to life. Just to sort of quickly recap, you have Azure and all of the run rich runtime services. No, I want uh, Sachi to say that was mixed dope. reality services in Azure. Mm -hmm. I uh, don't. He would be. He, was, he said that. I would. I would let. I would give him a pass. With data. Say, okay. He wouldn't you can though. Bring all it was worth of your it for own that. data. Power Platform on top of it can be the extensibility framework. In fact, Power Platform is the extensibility framework for both Microsoft 365 and Dynamics 365, as well as your SaaS applications. And then on top of it, you have Microsoft 365 as well as Dynamics 365. So the ability for a developer to take the full stack, whatever layer that makes sense for you, that's the type of application development that we envision uh, going forward. Now, this last platform uh, has got you know real special place inside of Microsoft. It's gaming. It, you know, we can trace. Uh, gaming all the way back to the very origins of Microsoft. In fact, this is a program that Bill wrote, uh, very famous, uh, one night uh, when he, I think this is just before the first IBM PC-DOS operating system came out, and he had worked, obviously, on the 
uh, basic runtime, and somebody said, hey, you need to build a sample app, and so he decided to build donkey.bass that night. And, um, you know, it's up on GitHub. I don't know what the pull request status is. I'm sure it'll improve <laughs> after today. Uh, but it is, uh, so for us, gaming is always uh, been uh, very important, uh, and we are very committed to creating a tremendous opportunity going forward with gaming. And it starts with the same metaphor that we used for a Microsoft 365. That is by putting the gamer at the center and ensuring that they can play their games, of course, on the console, on the PC, as well as on mobile. Right? That's what all of our innovation uh, is centered on, whether it is what we're doing with the Xbox, what we're doing with PC gaming, uh, what we're doing with Game Pass, Mixer. It's to enable that future for gaming. Now, what that means is even for the game developer, we want to put the game developer at the center and bring the entirety of the Microsoft game stack so that developers can build amazing games. In fact, right on Azure, we have tremendous uh, traction for game development. Uh, you have people like Rare, Ubisoft, Wizards of the Coast, all building these amazing game experiences using the power of the cloud. But there are two examples I just wanted to call out as part of game stack. The first one is Xbox Live. Now, Xbox Live has got 63 million uh, users. It's the most vibrant gaming social network out there. And now it's available uh, on uh, iOS and Android. That means game developers on iOS and Android can incorporate the network into their gameplay and help really drive engagement. And it's really exciting to see Gameloft uh, the creators of very big hit games from Asphalt to uh, Order and Chaos and Modern Combat, all incorporating uh, now Xbox Live as part of their gaming. So we think of uh, you know, basically Xbox Live being brought to uh, mobile platform as being super helpful for game developers. Another service that I want to highlight is Azure PlayFab. Now, Azure PlayFab really captures, I think, the essence of what game development is all about, because game development doesn't stop with the game being launched. In some sense, you could even say it starts after the game is launched, because you want to be able to experiment, learn through analytics, and continuously change gameplay. And that's what is described as live ops. Just like how we have DevOps, with game development, you have something called live ops, which I think increasingly is going to be true in many of the other application development categories as well, but for sure in gaming. And that's what Azure Play Fab enables, which is it's a rich pass service. It's already got a billion accounts in it for, because of the gamers, uh, because all the developers using it are really using uh, these accounts to help drive gameplay in a personalized basis. And it's really exciting to see Roblox partner up with Azure PlayFab to bring this to their community of developers. So we are very, very excited uh, to see how this really enables all of the community of developers building on Roblox to be able to use game PlayFab and really enhance Is Roblox a Minecraft so competitor, again, would you say, or a different audience? Very rich similar audience. It's, a, a, it's a different thing, but it's a similar audience. Same age group. The hardware consists of a master control and two player control units. What if everyone wanted to game? Could. Could. What if everyone who wanted a game could? I think Grandma was making a podcast. <laughs> okay, so there, this is a Something. video about accessibility. So. And of course, Microsoft's holiday ad featured the Xbox uh, accessible controller. And I think that was a great success. There were rumors they're working on a Braille controller as well. Oh. What they're not going to mention is that uh, they're way behind PlayStation 4 and Xbox sales. What if the next game it's is really inside It's really exciting you? to...
to see the developer opportunity in front of I us. Went, what you saw today I don't know if that's what's inside me, but it's... Best modern technology <laughs> Whatever it is, needs to come out. Definitely wants out. <laughs> AI, business process automation, communications and productivity, as well as gaming. That's the old saying, everybody has a book inside These platforms them. are rich canvases for you in this era of the cloud and the edge to enable you to turn the dreams that you all have into reality. Not just imagine the future, but to create it, to build these magical experiences. Magical experiences that empower people to be more productive and collaborative. Magical experiences that help organizations to grow, evolve, thrive. Magical experiences that address the most pressing challenges out there, whether in education, healthcare, Magical experiences that help people connect, relax, have fun. It's this community here that has the power to create that future. And most importantly, to build a world that we all want to live in. I can't wait to see the magic you build, but first I want to leave you with a sneak peek to some magic our team is creating right outside this convention center. Thank you all very, very much. I have a fantastic build. <gasps> Is it over? <laughs> so excited. I was really worried. I'd heard there was going to be an admission. I thought, well, but it's not over yet. We've got to watch showing, a movie. Yeah, what's going on right outside. Um, there's a guy on a bench. He left his phone behind. It's Johnny he had two Ive. phones. Is it Johnny Hive? <laughs> now, she's picking up his phone. Wait. No, he oh, took, he took the wrong phone. He took her phone. She wasn't even there a minute ago. I don't understand how that <laughs> happened. Oh, so she oh, can just use his phone. She's going to now use his phone to imagine a world where pigs <laughs> want... Minecraft. Oh, that's Minecraft. <gasps> uh -huh. Some townspeople are just... Oh. May 17th. That's an announcement of some <laughs> sort. Actually, May 17th, is that going to be the 10th the anniversary of Minecraft, the party that Notch was not invited to? Probably. So we're going to wander off because I think Paul and Mary Jo are now going to come in and, and make some sense of what we uh, just saw. I think we made pretty good sense of what we just saw. <sighs> uh, it was hard to stay awake, but I <laughs> I don't, you know, there were a few announcements that were interested, uh, interesting. The Fluid Framework I thought was interesting, what they're doing with Chromium, the new version of Edge based on Google's uh, Chromium platform. Um, but a lot of it was really just touting all the things people are doing with Microsoft and, and all the partners mm -hmm. and what they're doing. I like the election guard where they were talking about the open source project. That's interesting. Yeah, they, they want to uh, allow voters to follow their vote from the time they make it to the time it's counted and make mm -hmm. sure it's counted properly. I think that's interesting. And that'll be live on GitHub, yeah. they said, this month. Yeah. And I thought the, the Minecraft AR thing, that was kind of a throwaway at the end there with that little video, but that might be mm -hmm. kind of interesting. Too. So I uh, I'm, thank you for joining us. A rem reminder that tomorrow we're going to do the same thing with Google I.O. I think that will be more interesting, frankly. I think they're a little better at uh, showmanship and maybe even have some more things to show. Um, stay tuned, though, because Paul and Mary Jo are at Build, and they're going to be doing uh, their analysis of uh, Satya Nadella's keynote. And, of course, at 1 o'clock this afternoon in about three hours, uh, we will reconvene for... Windows Weekly. Thank you, Megan Maroney, for joining me today. Thank you for having me. You can go back to bed now. <laughs> I certainly will. Thank you all for joining us for our coverage of Microsoft's 2019 Build Vision Keynote. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.